folks, it's Jeff here. Just a quick reminder, if you're loving Disney Coast to Coast, there are a couple of easy ways that you can support the show. We'd love it if you could rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you listen to the show. This is a simple way to help other Disney fans find us. Also, go ahead and share your favorite episodes on social media and be sure to tag us. You can find all of our social media information at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. And finally, I just want to say thank you to all of you who listen every week. Your support is very appreciated, and we love that you're enjoying our Disney geekiness. Now on with the show. Is your magic meter running low? Well, we've got a cure for you. Welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauly, and today on the show, I have Mr. Kyle Burbank joining me from laughingplace.com. Hello, Kyle. How's it going? Hey, Jeff. I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing good, but I think you're doing better because you recently went to Hong Kong Disneyland to check out the premiere of Ant-Man and the Wasp Nano Battle. Yep. I, I sure did. It was exhausting, but it was, it's fun. Okay, cool. Let's get into that trip report right now. Travel along and stamp those passports in today's Disney Trip Report. Okay, well, you say it was exhausting. What is? It? How long is that flight? You are based where? I'm in Springfield, Missouri. So we actually drove to Atlanta for the flight. And then that took us to Seoul. And then we had a layover in Seoul and then went to Hong Kong. And the flight from Atlanta to Seoul was 14 and a half hours. Oh, So that's a new record for me. My previous record was from Seattle directly to Hong Kong, and that was about 14. So just barely beat that. I got to be honest, like that is a huge part of the reason why I haven't done those parks yet is like I dread that trip. And I keep saying whenever I do it, I'm going to take full advantage of that long, long flight and do them all at once. You know, just take a month and do it because... I can't imagine doing that crazy flight multiple times, you know, within several years. And somebody else told me recently they actually did a cruise that took them over there and then spent some time there and cruised back. And I was like, oh, that may be the way for me to do it. That obviously takes a tremendous amount of time and money. But yeah, that's not a bad idea. What what I did like about this one was that the flight from Atlanta didn't leave until 1 a.m. So I actually managed to sleep for about half of it, which was I was very surprised. Yeah, I, I am a terrible airplane sleeper for two reasons number one i tend to i sleep on my stomach so you can't do that on a plane so i'm already like in an unnatural position but number two i'm the type of person that if i get like i'm really 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 good at cat naps if i get like a 15 minute cat nap i am wired for a few hours like it's just like a bolt of energy for me and that's great in most scenarios except for when you're on an airplane and there's a slight bit of turbulence that wakes you up And then I'm like wired and can't fall back asleep. So if I were to ever do that 14 hour uh, flight, I definitely need to go to a doctor and get like a prescription in order to do it. So that is probably in my future at some point. The only time I slept tremendously on a flight was I was flying actually back from Awalani back to LA, which is I think about six hours or so. And that morning I went on a hike in the like Hawaiian rainforest and I was just so exhausted. It was literally like slept through the entire flight. And at the moment I landed, I was like, this is the greatest thing in the world. Like if you can just sleep through an entire flight, it's wonderful. So anywho, you went to Hong Kong Disneyland for the new Ant-Man and Wasp attraction. And I am curious, had you seen the movies Yes. Uh, okay. My wife and I are both big fans of the movies. The Ant-Man one, we actually missed the Ant- the first Ant-Man in theaters. I, I don't know why. Uh, and then caught it later and it became one of our favorites. Like, it's just really funny and enjoyable. So we're really excited for the sequel and then saw that in theaters, of course. And like all of Phase 3, we purchased it on Blu-ray the day that came out. So, yeah. Wait a sec. What, what, phase 3? What's that? Okay, so the Marvel movies are broken down into phases. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have phase one that ends with the Avengers, and the second one actually ends with Ant-Man, and then we're in the third one right now, which is going to end with Endgame. Okay, but there are only two Ant-Man movies, right? Yes. Okay, cool. When you said phase three, that's been But we've been big fans of phase three, and so we've been buying all those on Blu-ray. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. So for folks like myself who don't really know the Ant-Man films, why don't you give us a brief synopsis of what the first and second film, what, who the characters are real briefly. <laughs> so what they're Paul, all about. 
Paul Rudd plays Ant-Man and his ability is that he can shrink and later we learn that he can grow <laughs> to different heights. Um, he can also telepathically communicate with the ants and, uh, you know, use them as his, his army. Uh, and, you know, it's a Marvel movie. So there's heroes and there's villains and saving the world and all sorts of things like that. And then Evangeline Lilly is the wasp. And um, both of them actually reprise their roles for this attraction, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, they're definitely more humorous, a different kind of humor than like Guardians of the Galaxy, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, for reference, the first one was going to be directed by Edgar Wright before he dropped out. So there's a little bit of his type of humor in there as well. I Now, Evangeline Lilly, she wasn't introduced until the second movie, or was she in the first one as well? She's in the first one, but she wasn't the Wasp. Gotcha. Okay. These, you know, I mean, anybody that listens to this show regularly knows that I am not a Marvel fan. I don't, I've tried, I really have, and I apologize. I know it's offensive to a lot of people that I don't love it, but I simply don't. But I have learned one thing. I think, in fact, I went and saw Shazam, which I know is, is DC, it's not Marvel, but like Guardians of the Galaxy, I enjoy. Shazam, I really enjoyed. I think Ant-Man, I might enjoy, because correct me if I'm wrong, it's really silly and comedic, right? I would think so, yeah. Okay. I think I like it when they're kind of ridiculous, because I, a superhero movie taking itself seriously is just laughable to me. I sat through the last Avengers movie, and I, I was just, I, I just think it's ridiculous. But yeah. Especially so, in the first Ant-Man, they definitely acknowledge that just the idea of it being Ant-Man is stupid. And so they yeah. make fun of it. Like, is it too late to change the name? Like, yeah, you want yeah, me yeah. to be Ant-Man? What? And let's face so. it, like, the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids uh, parallels are insane. And, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, obviously, that is exciting to me as well. In fact, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, they showed, like, the sneak preview of this in the Bugs Life Theater at Disney California Adventure back in the day. And I was like, this is, like, su such the perfect location to show this show. I don't know. It just looked fun to me. So I might actually check out the Ant-Man movies at some point. Plus, I love Paul Rudd. Like, who doesn't love Paul Rudd? And he just turned 50. The week we're I heard that. He just turned 50, which is ridiculous. Like, he looks amazing. I'm sure there's somebody out there who, who you know, he drives them, Paul Rudd drives them crazy or whatever. But to them, I say, you know, you're a fool. Paul Rudd's amazing. But he was there, and you were there to see Paul Rudd at the grand opening ceremony of the new attraction. Yeah, so a couple days before, the official grand opening was on March 31st, but on the 28th or so, I think it was, they had a grand opening ceremony where they had Paul Rudd, they had uh, director Peyton Reed, who did the first, directed both movies. Um, Evangeline Lilly wasn't there, because I guess she was filming in uh, Mon Montreal, maybe it was? Yeah, I think that's what so she said, yeah. So she sent a video, um, and then they also had, you know, uh, Joe Casada from Marvel, um, Bob Weiss is the head of uh, Imagineering, and uh, Kevin Feige, president of Marvel Studios. So yeah, they just had, and then also people from the government, because the Hong Kong Disneyland Park is partially owned by the Hong Kong government, um, so they had a representative from there. I think majority and, owned by the, I think it's like 53% think, is the Hong Kong government. Yeah, I forget. I know Disney has taken a little bit more in recent years with okay. some of the expansions, so I don't remember if they have majority yet, but hmm. um, they also have, there's, I, I forget her name, unfortunately, but she's a apparently a big star in Hong Kong, and she is in the attraction as well. She speaks mostly um, Cantonese, and... Uh, in the ride, but she also speaks some English. So that's kind of a trick that they do in a lot of the foreign parks is they'll have one character speaking English and another character speaking the native tongue. Yeah. So uh, so she fits that role. I'm always really impressed by that when, they, when they're able to do that uh, so seamlessly. I mean, obviously we can tell one of the characters is speaking a different language, but I, you never really feel like you're missing out on the story. And whoever does the writing for that seems to do a really good job. I remember in Disneyland Paris, I, I found it interesting that like Leota would swap back and forth in the Haunted Mansion between English and French. And I remember seeing Honey, I Shrunk the Audience in Disneyland Paris. And I remember that was all in French, except we had headphones that we put on and mm -hmm. it would be in English that way. So they have fun little ways of getting around that. And obviously, you know, these 
parks are in foreign countries, but a huge part of their audience is English speaking as well. So they do have to work on that. But I got to say, I watched video of this grand opening and they're always so awkward to me. Like, they, yes, I, it's just, I don't know. First of all, it's, it's funny because, you know, the people who aren't actors or, and aren't used to being in front of an audience, <sighs> They struggle very often, but even then sometimes like Paul Rudd, I felt like was falling flat in a lot of cases, but I was like, oh, maybe people here aren't speaking English, so they're just not getting these jokes. It, it's always so probably awkward. a 14 hour flight. We can, we can, yeah, yeah. To that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he had that 14 hour flight to deal with. Yeah. But, uh, but people just, over there loved him. Like he was, well, wa- we saw him walking out when I was in line for the attraction, he was walking and there was a big group gathered in front of the attraction. Yeah. And he was trying to walk backstage. He was signing autographs with everyone, taking pictures. The, the cheers for him were were huge. I and mean, Kevin Feige had a posse too. People I, were all excited to meet him. I do love Paul Rudd. How do you feel about him? Are you indifferent? or No, I love Paul Rudd. He's in Clueless. So, yeah. I mean, that alone. Is, <laughs> he's in and he's on Friends. I mean, like, he's just a recurring part of my life. He's on Friends? Yeah, he plays Phoebe's husband. For how long? Uh, like the last two or three seasons. Okay, I'm not going to lie. That makes me more interested in watching Friends. <laughs> I've never really sat and watched it. I've seen maybe one or two like full episodes. But wow. All right. Uh, there's actually total tangent here, but there's a great movie. Uh, have you seen on Netflix, the Netflix original movie with him, Fundamentals of Caring? No, I haven't. Do you know of this? Have you seen the trailer? No. You need to see it. If you like Paul Rudd, see this movie. It's a great movie. It's a really touching coming-of-age story about this like 18-year-old kid who's in a wheelchair, but Paul Rudd becomes his caretaker, and he takes him on a road trip. It's it's a really great, funny, touching movie with a really twisted sense of humor. Um, highly suggested, so check that out. But in any case, the grand opening event was fairly short from what I saw. It was only about six minutes online. Was it a bigger thing when you were there? I think it was, um, I think a little bit longer than, than six minutes because they did have a few different speakers. But no, it was a pretty short thing. They they had mostly media, but then they also had invited fans as well. Okay, So cool. they filled, uh, it was held in the theater where they do Mickey and the Wondrous Book, which, by oh. the way, is an awesome show. Way better than Magical Mickey Map, Magical in my opinion. Map. Yeah. I, I've seen video of Wondrous Book, and it looks really, really good. It's in an indoor theater, which, yeah, you know... Yeah, which obviously... I didn't know, because uh, I hadn't seen the show before this visit. So, when I thought we were going to be sitting out in the sun, which was going to be awful. And then I was very relieved to find out it was indoors. Yeah, that's awesome. So, after that, of course, you were there opening day. So, what was that experience like? From what I understand, Ant-Man and the Wasp is, like, a huge franchise over in Hong Kong. Like... That country I mean, I loves guess. it. I, I wouldn't have expected it, um, but it seemed to have a good amount of fans. I think maybe just Marvel in general, maybe not specifically that. I think maybe this franchise just lended itself better to the type of attraction they were looking to do. Sure. Um, but we we got there at Rope Drop and managed to go straight to the attraction and got on within 15, 20 minutes. Oh, nice. Um, and I was curious to see, because in the past times I've visited Hong Kong Disneyland, like the wait times have never been significant. Like there are a few lower capacity rides that might, you know, get up to 45 minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. But all day when I would check on this attraction, it was still at, I think the highest I saw was an hour. Oh, that sounds heavenly (laughs) compared to the wait times in the U S parks. So, wow. So then we went the day after opening day and then, you know, it, we timed it right. It was mostly at 20 to 30 minutes for the day. But if we we went during the parade and it walked on with about 10 minute wait. So we got to do it four times, five times. The first time I had a camera in my hand, so I don't really count that. Sure. Because uh, um, as it's covering it for Laughing Place, as well as our friends at Attractions Magazine. So had to get footage, but then I got to write it four more times uh, over the course of two days. So very cool very cool and no so in case people don't know this attraction is an overlay essentially of buzz lightyear was it space ranger spin there or astro yeah, blasters uh, no, astro blasters they called it astro blasters okay so it was an overlay which to be completely honest until i started doing research on this i didn't realize that um, so what's what's the attraction story i guess what's the what's happening in this attraction as to why we're going on this journey so what's actually kind of cool, and um, I hope I'm not jumping ahead here, but they, it ties actually into Iron Man Experience, which is next door. Which is awesome. Like, I, I love that. That was my favorite detail about this. Because, first of all, okay, since we're going there, let's just talk about 
Tomorrowland is essentially being taken over by Marvel and Hong Kong Disneyland. Yeah, they are so they still, still have all the Space Mountain and they have an uh, Astro Orbiter and things like that. But then they have this other section of Tomorrowland called the Stark Expo. Yeah. And so Iron Man's attraction opened, what was that, maybe a year 2017. ago? 2017. 2017, so two years yeah, ago. Yeah, I was there for the grand opening of that one as well. Oh, okay, cool. So you make that flight every time a new ride opens. <laughs> <laughs> but so the Iron Man is the Iron Man experience, right? That's what it's called? Yes. And that took over Star Tours? It did actually didn't take over Star Tours. It's just very much, it's very Star Tours-esque. I, okay. But I'm pretty sure it was built... Um, on its own. Okay. So it's a basically... They didn't have a Star Tours before. So that's a Star Tours-like experience, and this is an Astro Blasters-like exp- experience. And, I mean, I kind of hate that, but at the same time, they seem to have plussed them. Yeah, I, I'd say so. The one thing that is kind of weird about the Ant-Man uh, ride is that they Tony Stark plays a part in it, but Tony Stark, in this case, is not Robert Downey Jr., so you only see Iron Man, so you don't see his face, so it's not quite sure. as weird. But you sure. can tell that the voice isn't quite Robert Downey Jr. But then yeah. you have actual MCU characters and Paul Rudd and eventually Lily. Yeah, I one of the things that I kind of wish, th- you know, as you mentioned, you we see these characters on screens and stuff in the attraction, but I feel like with the superheroes, you really have a good opportunity to create audio animatronics easier than like if they're in full costume right there could be a cool audio animatronic figure where you're not showing the actor's face or anything and you don't have to deal with that issue so i wish that we had some of that i mean this really was from what i could see buzz lightyear with a few screens added uh yeah and i think based on the concept art that was something that people were kind of expecting there to be like a big giant man oh okay animatronic and that didn't come to be unfortunately but yeah so, so what is the uh, the story of the attraction? So there's an attack on Hong Kong during the Stark Expo. And so I guess, you know, while Iron Man is taking on these big bots, there's also these tiny bots that are trying to take control. And so your job is to go in and then there's, you know, different types of bots and there's ones that the weak spot is worth more points. So they keep that where different shapes are different point values. Um. And yeah, you just got to go kill as many bots as possible. Okay, so it's a fairly simple concept. Uh, I don't. Yeah. What did you? I think? mean, it's it, there's also a language barrier, so you got to keep it simple. Sure, sure. So, but what did you think of it overall? Were you was there anything like about it that surprised you? Well, I will say that I they, they definitely improved the technology of the attraction, and I guess some of the things that they implement have already been used at the um, Shanghai version. Of Buzz Lightyear, but it's been about three years since I wrote that, so I only okay. did it once. Don't really remember. But first of all, the laser on your blaster is so much better. Like it's so easy to tell which uh, which one is you, uh-huh. and they also use screens for the targets, which makes it really easy to tell. And there's actually feedback on the blaster, so it kind of vibrates a little bit and makes a sound, so you know when you hit a target which is something that's kind of annoying. Sometimes on Buzz Lightyear, I feel like you can be aiming and aiming and never know if you actually (laughs) hit something unless you're staring at your point total. You know what I always felt uh, those attractions were missing is I'm always surprised they don't just fill the rooms with haze. That way you could actually see your laser beam when you shoot it. This one, yeah, even without the haze. like The the laser is really strong. And the other thing that's kind of cool about the the screen-based targets is that as you get further into the ride some of them will actually close to make it a little bit more challenging so once you hit it a couple of times it'll turn off for a little bit okay cool so um does everybody have the same color laser still or do they change colors to make it easier there's two different colors so okay. what's it's actually kind of strange because there's a red one and then it looks like a blue one but i think when you're actually shooting it it's green oh okay. so i thought that was a little strange unless i'm just <laughs> colorblind that's funny so okay so i mean it's fairly simple concept i mean you ride through i I did notice you shrink at some point during this attraction and yeah i guess video (laughs) yeah so that's what i was going to ask on video i see this and it really just looked like a strobe light and like and best moment of the attraction best moment of the attraction paul rudd 
honey, I shrunk the kids. I was like, yes, <laughs> they fit it in there. So that was awesome. But is there any sort of effect that happens other than the strobes that I saw on video? There's like a little video clip that plays when you shrink down. And then, yeah, it's mostly a strobe light to bring you back right before you exit. Okay, but the vehicle doesn't vibrate or anything. There's no good shrink effect or anything, right? Not really, no. Okay. But oh, and I, I forgot to mention one thing, one disappointing change, in my opinion, is that you no longer control the spinning. I was going to ask you that. So, okay, because it looked like everybody, you know, like Haunted Mansion, once you hit certain points, you were redirected. And actually, one of the times I wrote it, um, we had broken down a little bit in the beginning, and... It seemed like it must have gotten out of sync because it was actually turning us around too early oh, no. during like the final battle. So that was disappointing. But yeah, I miss being able to control it because there were times where I wanted to go for certain targets and, you know, can no longer do that. Yeah, my guess is that you they probably save money. Well, actually, so here's the story I heard about the whole spinning of the attraction. So originally I, I don't know who had it first. I think Magic Kingdom must have had this attraction first because they had yeah. they called it Space Ranger Spin because from the story I've heard, they expected kids to really enjoy the fact that they got to control the ride vehicle and spin themselves in any direction they wanted. And they found that that wasn't really the case. The thing that kids really loved was the fact that they got to shoot these blasters. And that's why it was renamed Astro Blasters for Disneyland when they put it in there. Hmm. So my guess is that they were like, okay, so spinning yourself isn't the most popular thing about it. And if we don't make it so that you spin yourself, that probably means they have to dress less of the attraction because, you know, if you're, if you're able to control the vehicle, you really have to dress 360 the entire time. Whereas if you're directing the guest's viewpoint, you really just have to focus on whatever area you're you're pointing them at. So yeah, maybe, maybe that has something to do with it as well. I don't know. But um, I do love this, this tie-in, as you mentioned, to the Iron Man experience. And there's only one other attraction I can think of that kind of has that or they don't even, you know, both of them don't even exist anymore, but they had that kind of, like, through line of the two attractions. Actually, no, I'm lying. I can think of two. Are there any attractions you can think of that kind of have that connection where two different attractions really connect? Yeah, I was thinking of, in Paris, Phantom Manor and um, Big Thunder. Oh, Phantom Manor and Big Thunder. Okay. I wasn't even thinking of that one. yet. Even at Disneyland, there is that whole... Um, you know, it's not, it's not like official, but they were creating the storyline between Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion at Disneyland. I did a whole episode of it. I forget what it's called, but it's probably called the Haunted Mansion and Pirates if you want to listen. Um, but okay. So that's one. The other ones I was thinking of was Carousel of Progress and Horizons were really oh. connected because they use that, the same family and you heard Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow in both attractions. The other thing I thought of was Honey, I Shrunk the Audience and and uh, Figment, yes. Journey into Imagination. No, that, that's, that's a good one. Has a nice little time. I love it when they do that. I think that that's, that's great. I, I would love a land where every attraction is like connected somehow, but they're not. it's not like one giant IP, you know? Yeah. That'd and you mentioned earlier that they have the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids line in Ant-Man, but you know that there's another connection? I do, Honey, I but I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you tell the story. Okay, so um, Peyton Reed, who directed Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp, actually also directed the pre-show for Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. Was it the pre-show or the whole thing? That, according to IMDb, it's the pre-show. Okay, I had read he directed Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, but I don't know, one of those two, so uh, I'm all for that. I mean, whenever you can work. I, just, I wish there was like a Wayne Zielinski moment in the attraction. Well, he also said that like he tr wanted to get... Um, Oh my gosh, I just forgot your favorite guy's name. Wait, Rick Moranis. Uh, Rick Moranis, yes. He wanted to get him an Ant-Man to play like Paul Rudd's dad or something. Shut up. Are you serious? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's what articles online say. I don't know how serious talks were or anything, but I guess he, he did have the idea to include oh. him in those movies. That breaks my heart to know that that was like a possibility. But <laughs> Well, still could be. There could be a third it. one. Oh, man, that needs to happen. I mean, I, then I would definitely, definitely go see an Ant-Man movie if that were the case. I would be all about that. Um, now, there was something when I was reading from the D23 site that I wanted to mention. Uh, we were talking about how the two, how, you know, the two Marvel attractions are connected. And they do say, in case you were wondering, no, it doesn't matter which attraction you hop on first. It all makes sense either way, including when a third Marvel-themed attraction opens in 2023. 
did we know about this third attraction or was that just kind of a slip? No, we I th- we knew about it before. I think it was announced when they revealed that they're when they so they've done it in kind of a weird rollout. So I think they officially announced the DCA Marvel Land at the same time that they announced the Hong Kong and Paris ones. Okay. But they'd already announced elements of the other two before that. So like in Paris, we already knew about the rock and roller coaster replacement mm-hmm. before they officially announced a whole Marvel area for that park. Okay. Interesting. So, I mean, they, they keep expanding this whole Marvel thing. I mean, at some point, I feel like it's just going to become Marvel Land as opposed to Tomorrowland. If they could figure out a way to retheme Space Mountain. Yeah, I feel it, like they're going to annex that <laughs> that whole area. Yeah, it's it's interesting. But I think it's kind of, I mean, it's no secret I don't love the fact that Disney owns Marvel. But I think that the way they're handling it in Hong Kong is pretty darn cool. I, I think it's it's working for them. Yeah, I think it's what people a, a lot of people expected for Disneyland's Tomorrowland in terms of the whole Stark Expo thing. I think a lot of people saw that as an opportunity and a segue, um, and I, that's what they ended up doing. Yeah. So you mentioned Disneyland, and here's my thoughts on that. I would say with Galaxy's Edge open. I do want Star Tours to close. As much as I love Star Tours, I think it's very weird to have an entire land dedicated to Star Wars and have this solo attraction somewhere else, no pun intended. Um, I I think that's weird. And I've heard both. I've heard it's staying. I've heard it's going. I don't know which is the case. So if it were to go, I would say, well, okay, you know, what's the name of the guy who's head of parks? I'm blanking. Um, um, JPEG? JPEG, yeah. His favorite thing to do is copycat attractions. It's cheap, and, you know, if the movies are popular... It- well, they can't quite copy... That's the thing, is they can't quite do Iron Man Experience here because it's set in Hong Kong. So, th- that's... Well, that was another thing I was going to say. Even Ant-Man, on a much lesser degree, the story is that you're saving Hong Kong. So, I'm sure some dialogue in the pre-show mentions that and stuff. It is very... I love the fact that these attractions are specific to Hong Kong Disneyland. I think that that's great. Now, having said that, like Soren, they could switch out some video footage. It wouldn't be an exact copycat, but the reality is they could reuse the Star Tours ride system, uh, reuse a lot of the information and technology they have for the Iron Man experience in Hong Kong, bring that to Disneyland and update some of the film, and they'd be good, right? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, you have a flyover Hong Kong Disneyland at the beginning, which is already going to be outdated because the castle is old. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, some other Hong Kong landmarks. But yeah, I suppose if it's it's mostly just the beginning and the end that if you clipped, you wouldn't really be able to tell. I mean, let's face it, though. How many years did uh, Soren over in Epcot soar over Disneyland and not Walt Disney World? I mean, some, yeah. sometimes they just don't care about those little details. But like Soarin over, uh, Soarin' Around the World these days, we have multiple version uh, endings. So they could make a switcheroo like that with Iron Man experience. So I was going to say, if you know, Tomorrowland needs help. I certainly don't think that Disneyland's Tomorrowland should be renamed. It is the original Tomorrowland, so I think it should always be known as Tomorrowland. But... If they wanted to put Iron Man Experience there, and then right across from that is Astro Blasters and make that the Ant-Man and Wasp attraction, they kind of could semi-easily. The only reason I would be like, please don't ever do that now, is because they've already committed to an entire Marvel-themed land at Disney California Adventure right across the Esplanade. So I kind of feel like they did things backward and wrong when it comes to this. If they wanted... You know, obviously, a new Spider-Man attraction and a new Avengers attraction is an exciting thing. But, like, part of me is like, okay, people are going to shoot me for saying this, but, like, get rid of Autopia, get rid of the submarines, because we all know they're on their way out. That's all we keep hearing is that they're on their way out. If they're going to do that, put Spider-Man and Avengers there, update Iron Man, and this is where Star Tours is. And I don't know. I feel like the opportunity to do it at Disneyland was really great yeah well i also wonder if they're just going to keep those two attractions exclusive to hong kong um kind of as a penance for how disney has treated hong kong disneyland over the years perhaps Um, and that's also kind of why i wonder if if ant-man and the wasp is really that popular over there or if it was one that disney was kind of willing hey this works well enough and we can burn off this property (laughs) over there sure 
Yeah. And now, do you happen to know, obviously, every, you know, most people know about the whole situation between Universal um, Orlando and, and Walt Disney World and how many of the Marvel attractions can't be used at the Walt Disney World parks. But do you know, could Ant-Man and the Wasp be used in those parks? I mean, I, I don't know for sure. My my gut would say that technically they probably could if they're using like Guardians of the Galaxy. But the trick is they can't say Marvel. Like even at yeah. Disneyland, you'll notice that it's anything superhero. that's Marvel, they just say, yeah, superhero. They'll lose like a Marvel-esque logo. It's it's very strange to me. Uh, yeah, that is bizarre. And it's only going to get worse with, with certain Fox properties that, that are now part of the, the mix as well. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, do you think... What I mean, obviously, you went on a business trip to experience this, but like, is this an e-ticket attraction? Is it a draw in the park? What is it? I think it's a nice addition to the park. I wouldn't say it's worth buying your ticket specifically out there for, but I think that park is, I mean, I love that it's expanding because it's very tiny and it can be done very quickly. Yeah. But it's a very charming park. It's... it. it I mean, I understand the frustrations people had when it first opened and it didn't have that expansion area because it, it's even with that expansion, it's still so tiny. But I, I love it there and it's I think it's really enjoyable. So I'm glad to see it getting some love now. Mm-hmm. And I think the attraction is, an, like I said, a nice addition, a good upgrade from Buzz that fits that fits the theme of that area really well. But I, I think it's definitely enjoyable. I don't think it's the greatest attraction Disney's ever made by any means. Sure, sure. But I think that they did a good job with it overall for what for what it is. Yeah. Now, one of the things that they're doing over there that I find very exciting is their expansion of the castle. And now they really got screwed when it comes to Sleeping Beauty Castle there. Because when this park was, uh, cr- correct me if I'm wrong, this was soon after Euro Disney opened and was like a colossal disaster, right? Like I mean, years. But... It was started planning. Yeah. It opened yeah. in 2005. So they got And it little... was still in budget cut mode uh, okay. Yeah, under the Eisner era. There's actually a really great video about the history of it on uh, Defunct Land, if you ever I watched think that. I, yes, channel. I recently watched that. And so they were saving a ton of money um, by just copycatting the castle at Disneyland Park and but I will the- say even with the tiny castle it looks great because there's real mountains behind yeah. it so I actually kind of like the small castle I, I think it'll look I'll have to see how it looks with the big one but it is kind of cool to see like a tiny castle because then it gives you a better view of the real Hong Kong behind it Sure. One of the things I like about the expansion is that they are from what it looked like anyway in the renderings it looks like they're basically keeping Sleeping Beauty Castle as it was, and they're just kind of building on top of it. So that's what I got the sense of while I was there, because Sleeping Beauty Castle was still completely intact. Sure. So I feel by now they would have like raised it if it was not staying. Yeah. Have did you see any construction on the castle at all? Were, there was there some started? scaffolding on the back end. Okay. Not so much on the front. Um, it was hard to tell what, if anything, they were doing. And this is going to become a generic princess castle. There's going to be little touches of all the different Disney princesses. I don't know how I feel about that. I know Shanghai did the same thing um, with their castle. And, like, I get it from a business standpoint. You really get to cover a lot of IPs that way. But I don't know. I kind of like the ownership of uh, a castle, uh, you know, the ownership of a specific princess over the park. I'll still never understand why Disneyland Paris isn't Belle and Beast's castle. Like, that makes... No, as much as I love that castle, their castle is actually my favorite castle in Paris. But I, I'll never get why they didn't go with Bell and Beast for that. It seems weird. Yeah, well, I mean, they they actually took more of a page from Sleeping Beauty with the the square trees and everything. So. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, it's definitely closer design wise to the animated Sleeping Beauty um, than Disneyland's is. But that's because Disneyland's castle was built, what, four years before Sleeping Beauty <laughs> was even released. So yep. that's like, that's crazy to me that he had that much faith in a movie that was like four years out. I could be wrong about the number of years, but it was something like that. That he was like, yeah, I'm going to name the castle after this princess that like, let's face it, back in that time, I feel like Walt was working on a lot of movies that we ended up never hearing about. So he he had to have had a lot of faith in Sleeping Beauty uh, to have named the castle after that. But what else is going on over at Hong Kong? You said you've been there before. I guess what are the other expansions coming there? Because they are doing a ton of work in Hong so, Kong. So yeah, they're finishing up Marvel and then they're doing Frozen. 
I, I can't really see much there. There's some walls with uh, with frozen stuff on it, but that'll they, be on the they, other end of Fantasyland. Are, do we know if we're getting if they're getting the Epcot attraction? Um, I, they're getting a some version. I don't okay. know if it's the same. I f- I forget quite honestly. Okay, I and forget so- what parts we know and what we don't. They've released concept art, and but I don't think they've elaborated on what the ride. I know is. with all of the overseas announcements, sometimes it's like, okay, which park was that again? <laughs> it gets a little well, bit Well, yeah, because they're doing it. They're also doing the Frozen at you know, Tokyo Disney Sea and right? at yeah. Paris. So, yeah, it gets confusing. Yeah. So, you'd been to Hong Kong Disneyland before. It sounds like you're a fan of it. I would like to check it out. But is there anything in particular that's really, you know, we don't have here in the States that is kind well, of I think a must-see? The, the big one is Mystic Manor. Oh, yes. Uh, so, that I mean, that area is very cool and that attraction is a lot of fun it, it's definitely got every time i ride it i forget that how many like uncomfortable scenes in a good way you know like you know you get kind of tense mm. um but yeah it, it's definitely a, a cool attraction and it was one of the first track trackless ride systems that we yeah. had i think maybe Pooh's honey hunt might have uh been first and then this was Sometime after, yeah. Uh, but that one's a lot of fun. And then I also their their ver- it's not really a version of Big Thunder, but it I always forget what the name is too. It's like the it's in Grizzly Gulch though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a big um, fan of that one. I, I I can only do it like once because it's a little you know much for for me in motion sickness. But it's kind of cool because it does have a backwards section. Okay. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a really cool area to walk through, even if you don't ride the coaster, just because it feels like you're just completely surrounded by it. Like there's a part where you can see three different pieces of track at the same time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. And it's also got a grizzly mountain that kind of reminds me of TCA. Okay. You so. mentioned the backward portion of the coaster. I got I to gotta be honest, as much as I love Expedition Everest, for some reason, the backward portion of that coaster makes me like really uncomfortable. It makes me tense up. It's, it feels like, yeah, it feels a lot stronger than it is. Like It feels like you're going up a loop when you're really only kind of going up a slight incline. I think it's got more g-force of going backwards or something yeah i'm not a, not a huge fan of the backward portion of that attraction as much as i love it but uh so so you would like hong kong like a lot of people talk smack about hong kong disneyland but you you're saying it's a park worth visiting yeah i mean th- let me preface this by saying like in terms of if you're gonna go the, the thing i would say is that i know as disney fans a lot of the times we feel like we need to spend as much time as possible in the parks on trips don't do that with Hong Kong. Go for two days max. They only sure. sell up to two day tickets. Um, but wow. go see the city. Go to the peak. Go to. They have big Buddha. We went to the for the first time. Um, it's a Tiantan Buddha, I think is what it's called. But anyway, yeah. Don't spend your entire time in the parks because, like I said, it's tiny and <laughs> I've never seen a wait over an hour. So you're gonna get through everything uh, within a day and a half. So. Do t- two days max and go see the rest of the city. Don't okay. just fly 14 hours for that. Okay, cool. And obviously it is quite the trip. So do you have any like tips when it comes to traveling there? What's the the must-dos yeah. to keep yourself sane? <laughs> um, well, I would say I, I've stayed on property at Hong Kong Disneyland. I stayed at the Hollywood Hotel, which I really enjoyed. But I've also found success staying off property. So I actually stayed at a hotel in Tung Chung, um, which is right where you actually get the cable cars to go up to that big Buddha, which was cool. And nice. it's uh, attached to a mall and also attached to a train station. So it was like two stops away from Disneyland. It was really convenient for kind of, you know, balancing the parks and the city. Um, the other thing I would recommend if you're going to go explore the city is to get an octopus card. It's 150 Wait a second, hon- say that again. <laughs> is it an octopus card? It's called an octopus card. Okay. And uh, what it is, is it's basically like a stored value card. Um, and it allows you just to tap when you enter the turnstiles at the train station and then tap when you exit and it'll automatically take your fare out. So that way you don't have to buy individual fare tickets each time. Sure. But it's 150 Hong Kong dollars up front. And uh, that comes with $100 of stored value and then a $50 deposit, which you'll get back if you return the card. And by the way, as, if you're converting from Hong Kong dollars to American, you divide by eight and then you're in the ballpark. Okay. So I found that to be, uh, I actually kept, I know you could return your uh, octopus card to get your refund, 
but we just kept them because I feel like I'll I'll be back and it makes traveling around there a lot easier. Cool. I am curious now, I've never been to Hong Kong Disneyland, but is it, I've seen the photos like you're talking about with the castle and the beautiful mountains in the background. So mm -hmm. is Disneyland there kind of like it's secluded own little thing, more like, you know, a Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World, or is it more like a Disneyland where you just drive a few feet and there's Hotel Row and all that stuff? Well, no, it's kind of cool is, so when I talk about the trains and stuff, to get to the Disneyland Resort from the trains, it actually has its own. So you get off at Sunny Bay, and then it has its own train, like uh, its own train yeah. line, and it looks kind of like the monorails at Tokyo Disneyland. So it's got like the Mickey handlebars and things like that. They even say like when you take the train back, it says now we're, we're now returning you to the modern city of Hong Kong. Okay. Um, so yeah, it does kind of feel like its own little corner of the island there. I like that. I like that. Do they they do fireworks there? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, some. They don't do like a nightly thing. They do, but I think it's one of those you know where there's not. It's not like a full on fireworks show. It's one of those projection and fireworks shows to gotcha. where it's you know slightly reduced. Okay. Cool. I is don't there anything think else? I saw fireworks while I was there? That might be <laughs> because the castle is under construction, but yeah. Is there anything else you want to say about Hong Kong Disneyland or Ant-Man and the Wasp Nano Battle? I feel like it needs to be said that way. I, I, I mean, I think I like it. Yeah. Is um, that how they say it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not quite that. Oh, actually, I did want to talk about one thing um, sure. that I found interesting in the queue during the videos. There's some PG humor that I hope is family appropriate because obviously it's an identity park, so it, sh it should be. Sure. Um, there's a part where Scott has... Uh, Scott is Ant-Man, uh, has a sketches for some upgrades he would like to his suit. And so he's showing it to Tony Stark. And uh, he's like, oh, so where should I leave this for you? And Tony's like, you don't want me to tell you where to put that. <laughs> and what's cool is they actually sell a t-shirt in the gift shop that's a that's Scott's sketch of, oh, the of all the different upgrades. That's and cool. There's another part where they're talking, Scott's talking about the the nano bots that they need to defeat and Tony's talking about uh, what's going on uh, the rest of the city and then eventually and Lily comes back on she's like if you two are done discussing bot sizes <laughs> so it's actually similar to something she says in one of the movies but yeah little suggestive PG humor that uh, I thought was interesting for, I feel, for a Disney I feel park like we're, yeah I feel like we're getting a little bit more and more of that uh, as time progresses but sometimes I can't think of anything specific, but every once in a while I'll hear something in the park like, uh, did they just say that? Like, it's it's a little crazy. So I feel like the Muppets can get away with doing stuff like that. And I feel like Marvel has a lot of opportunities, especially Ant-Man, which is like, from what I can tell, just a comedy. So anyway, that's going to wrap it up for this talk about Hong Kong Disneyland. And why don't well, you say the name of the attraction this time? I want to hear you say it. Ant-Man and the Wasp Nano Battle. Oh, come on. We na Nano battle. <laughs> Nano battle. There we go. Anyways, guys, I think that means it's trivia time. All right, Kyle, do you want to hit me with a trivia question first or shall I hit you? I'll go. Uh, I'll ask you one. Okay, cool. So Hong Kong Disneyland is home to a daytime parade called Flights of Fantasy. And the main theme for this parade has made its way to the domestic parks, albeit with different lyrics. So do you know where that version of the song can be heard? Oh, goodness. Okay, so the parade there has a musical theme that is now used in one of the U.S. parks, you're saying? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to guess it's in the Festival of Fantasy Parade at Magic Kingdom. You're kind of close. I'm kind of close. Uh, I don't know what that that could, does that mean it's in Magic Kingdom, but it's not the Festival of Fantasy Parade. It means it's a parade, but it's not a Magic Kingdom. <laughs> oh, is, is it the oh gosh, what uh, Mickey Sensational? Yeah. Which which musical theme? The Sensational theme. So it's basically, Sensational. Yeah. Ba -ba -ba -ba. So they were actually developed about the same time. Flights of Fantasy only opened about four months or so before Sensational. Okay. Um, but yeah, so the Hong Kong one is like. It's a sky high celebration. So come oh. on, come on. And then it goes, okay. Flights of Fantasy. And oh, da, da, sensational. Da, da, da. Goes, sensational. No so, yeah, kidding. same music, completely different lyrics, but yes, yeah, very recognizable. 
Interesting. I didn't know that at all. That's the one where all the characters fly, right? Is that the... Yes. Or am I thinking, what's the one with like Peter and Wendy flying and Mary Poppins flying? Is it's that probably shit? the... It's probably that. I The one that I remember is Pooh's in like a, a hot air balloon and stuff. Okay, cool. That's fun. I, I'm trying to think... I, is that Hong Kong? I don't know. There's somewhere I think, that... I mean, it's called Flights of Fantasy, so it would make a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense, yes. <laughs> I'm always, I've always wanted them to do a, a flight-themed fireworks show. Because, like, one of the most popular things, the thing that everybody oohs and ahs over during the fireworks shows, especially here at Disneyland, because we have much more control over the flight, is Tinkerbell flying. And we've, you know, added on Dumbo flying in certain versions. And I just Zero. feel like... Zero flies, and we've had the up house fly. I want a fireworks show of all flying characters where we we just use that uh, pixie dust zip line over and over again throughout the the show. I think it would be awesome. You could have Mary Poppins, you could have Buzz Lightyear, you could have Tank, you could have Dumbo, you could have I don't know who else flies. There's so many characters. Zero, as you mentioned, I think it would be so so cool. But yeah, that does they, sound cool. They haven't done that yet because then you'd have to pay a lot of stunt performers. My guess is. <laughs> That the, they like the ones that are like props. I'm pretty sure Zero's just a prop. The Up House is just a prop. Pretty sure Dumbo has a performer. Obviously, Tinkerbell does. So, well, they have case. that Dumbo drone now. Dumbo drone? Where is this? Uh, they've flown it over a couple of things. There's a video of it at Disney Studio, at the actual Walt Disney Studios. Yeah. Um, and then they flew it at some race in. Was it Fontana? And I think there was something else in Florida. I don't know. But oh, yeah, is this? there's like some some Dumbo drone. It's recent for the for the new movie. Interesting. Was this um similar to the new Fantasyland Dragon that they had? Um, probably. That it was just, so long ago, and only did like once or twice, huh? I, that's what blows my mind is they spend the time, money, and energy on building these things, and like they use them once, and it's so that's so weird to me. But I don't know. I guess that's what makes it special, right? Is it's so so rare to see. Yeah, it's probably because it's not ready for prime time, so they're just going to try it once to develop the technology. But that that would make sense if it's a continuation. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Anyway, I've got a trivia question for you about Hong Kong Disneyland. They have seven lands at Hong Kong Disneyland. I want to know if you can just name them all for me. Okay, so you have, I assume Main Street USA counts. Yep. Tomorrowland. Mm-hmm. Fantasyland. Yes. Adventureland. Yes. Mystic Point. Mystic Point, yep. Toy Story Land and Grizzly Gulch. Very good. So Grizzly Gulch is kind of like their frontier land, correct? Uh, yeah, for all intents and purposes. Okay, and then Mystic Point is kind of just its own thing? It's just its own thing, yeah. It's, a, it's the smallest land, I would think, because it only has Mystic Manor and a restaurant and a store, and then it has some optical illusions so mm -hmm. there's like different statues you know like there are three pieces then you view it from just the right angle and it looks like it's a single piece oh cool. things like that cool awesome well ding 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 you win i mean you should get it since you went there and everything <laughs> but I, f I find it interesting um just because there's some lands that you know don't exist anywhere else i have yet to actually ride anything in toy story land oh really i know that yeah that three is, trips it never actually done it from what I can tell, and I could be wrong because the one at Disney's Hollywood Studios is the only one I've done, but that seems to be the most extensive one, right? Like, even Shanghai's is pretty much carny rides, right? Yeah, I feel like, obviously, Slinky Dog Slinky Dog Dash is the most attractive and probably bigger, biggest scaled of any of the Toy Story lands that I've been to. Yeah. So there's that. But anyway, Kyle, thank you so much for coming on the show to talk about <laughs> Ant-Man and the Wasp <laughs> Nano Battle. But why don't you Thanks let the folks know me. where they can find you and uh, all the work you do for Laughing Place? Yeah, you can find me on my Twitter at Kyle Burbank. And then I also write for LaughingPlace.com. And they're on Twitter at Laughing underscore Place. And uh, yeah. Fantastic. Also, if you're into personal finance, you can follow at Money at 30, which is my personal finance site where I sometimes talk about Disney. There you go. And guys, I do, I do want to give a shout out to Leslie0307, who left a lovely five-star rating and review for Disney Coast to Coast on iTunes. I'm going to read it right now for self-indulgent purposes. Leslie said, I love this podcast. Jeff is an amazing host and super knowledgeable about all things Disney. Thank you. This podcast helps me get through long experiments. Being a 
a grad student can be very stressful, but this podcast helps take the stress away, so thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. I look forward to new episodes every week. So basically, what she's saying is Disney Coast to Coast makes people smarter. Isn't that what you got from that, Kyle? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Leslie0307, for doing that, and good luck with your studies. I also want to remind all of you that it is a new month, which means that there's a new DCTC music playlist over at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. This month is actually the 25th anniversary of the Broadway musical of Beauty and the Beast. Can you believe that, Kyle? No, I, I feel very old. Yeah, you've seen it, yeah? You've seen that production? No. You've never seen a production, a tour, or anything? I don't know if I've ever seen a Disney Broadway show at all. Oh, Kyle, we need to fix this. Uh, have you seen Newsies on Netflix, at least? The the Broadway musical? Kyle! Do you want me to answer? <laughs> oh, my gosh. No, your eyes said it all. I'm, 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 we're done. <laughs> In any case, there is a ton of new music, uh, specific and original, to the Beauty and the Beast Broadway musical. So I made a playlist featuring only the songs that you can find in the musical. So if you're like Kyle Burbank and are unfamiliar with that new music, you should sign up for that playlist because I'll tell you, it's phenomenal, phenomenal music. That's over at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. Just click on playlist. And while you're there, you can find all of our social media links as well. And uh, don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon over at Patreon.com slash DisneyCTC where you can get behind the scenes access, Q&A live streams, early episode releases, and you could even be a guest on Trivia sometime if you want. And it all starts for just $1 per month. Other than that, folks, have a magical day. Bye! Thanks for listening to Disney Coast to Coast. Have a magical day! <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com.